Friday, February 25th, Russian troops are bearing down on Ukraine's capital with explosions and gunfire sounding in the city. Ukraine's President Volodymyr Zelensky appeals to Russian President Vladimir Putin. I want to appeal to the President of Russia. All of Ukraine is involved in fighting. Let's sit down and talk to stop people from dying. It's not clear if Zelensky's last-minute offer of talks will be accepted by the Putin government or if the Russian troops will continue their assault on Kiev. The United States and European allies step up sanctions against Russia, adding measures that directly target President Putin and his top diplomat, Sergei Lavrov. White House Press Secretary Jen Psaki indicates the U.S. sanctions will include a travel ban. In alignment with the decision by our European allies, the United States will join them in sanctioning President Putin and Foreign Minister Lavrov and members of the Russian national security team. President Biden introduces federal appeals court judge Katanji Brown-Jackson as the first black woman on the Supreme Court, delivering on a campaign promise, moving to further diversify a court that was made up entirely of white men for almost two centuries. And U.S. officials say most Americans who live in places where healthy people can safely take a break from wearing masks. The Centers for Disease Control and Prevention outline a new set of measures for communities where COVID-19 is easing its grip. From Pacifica Radio, KPFA in Berkeley, KPFK in Los Angeles, this is the Evening News. I'm Mark Miracle. Invading Russian forces closed in on the Ukrainian capital, Kiev, today after a barrage of airstrikes on cities and military bases around the country. The advance is seen as an attempt to replace Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky with a Kremlin-friendly regime. Speaking from an undisclosed location, Zelensky said he was a direct target of the Russian invasion. I remain in the capital. My family is also in Ukraine. My children are in Ukraine. My family are not traitors. They are citizens of Ukraine. Where exactly they are, I have no right to say. According to the information we have, the enemy has marked me as target number one. My family as target number two. They want to damage Ukraine politically by destroying the head of state. The Ukrainian Defense Ministry urged ordinary citizens to make Molotov cocktails to hurl against invading forces. Officials banned all men between the ages of 18 and 60 from leaving the country. At the same time, Zelensky offered to talk to the Russian president, saying he was not afraid to negotiate about security guarantees and what he called neutrality. I want to appeal to the president of Russia. All of Ukraine is involved in fighting. Let's sit down and talk to stop people from dying. And now I want to appeal to the armed forces of Ukraine. Stay strong. You're everything that we've got and everything that protects and defends our country. Kremlin spokesman Dmitry Peskov describes Zelensky's offer as a move in a positive direction, which the Russian government had taken note of and now needed to analyze. But Russia's foreign minister, Sergei Lavrov, appeared to reject the offer as insincere. He is simply lying to you when he says he's ready to discuss Ukraine's neutral status. We suggested all sorts of options and President Putin discussed it with Macron. And he said it directly, the expansion of NATO is unacceptable. We wanted to seek further security options which would be guaranteeing demands for Ukraine, European nations and Russia. But our demands on security guarantees have not been met. Russia's Foreign Minister Lavrov suggested it was too late, saying Zelensky should have agreed to talks earlier on.
But late today, Zelensky's spokesman wrote on Facebook that the two sides are consulting on a place and a time for talks. Hungary's foreign minister offered Budapest as a possible location. Also writing on Facebook, he said he put the proposal to both Russia's and Ukraine's government, and neither had yet dismissed it. Before the invasion, the West had rejected Russia's demand to keep Ukraine out of NATO. Putin used that refusal to justify the invasion, claiming the West left him no other choice. With growing signs that Russia may aim to overthrow him, Ukrainian President Zelensky told European leaders in a video link-up from his bunker last night that it might be the last time they saw him alive. But today, Zelensky released a video of himself and his senior aides outside the presidential office in Kiev to reassure Ukrainians that he and other top officials would stay in the capital. The assault, anticipated for weeks by the West, amounts to Europe's largest ground conflict since World War II as President Putin tries to restore Moscow's Cold War influence. It's unclear how much or how little Russian forces have seized, or the extent of the casualties in the fighting. British Prime Minister Boris Johnson said he's in close contact with Ukrainian President Zelensky as he hailed the fierce bravery and patriotism of Ukraine's government and people. Reporter Ali Barrett in London. The characterization from Boris Johnson that he says it's a catastrophe engulfing the country. He says, um, he told uh, leaders according to Downing Street that President Putin's engaging in a revanchist mission to overturn the post Cold War order. And we're told that Boris Johnson also warned fellow leaders um, that Vladimir Putin's ambitions might not stop there. Ollie Barrett, London. Britain has imposed asset freezes and other sanctions on scores of Russian companies and several oligarchs and has joined the U.S., Canada, and the European Union in slapping sanctions on Putin and Lavrov. The Pope broke protocol with an in-person visit today to the Russian embassy to express his concern about the war in Ukraine. Pope Francis's extraordinary gesture was viewed as a sign of his anger at Russia's actions and his willingness to make a personal appeal for the end of hostilities. The Pope traveled to and from the embassy in a small white car with Vatican officials saying they knew of no such previous papal initiative. President Biden and his NATO counterparts agreed to send thousands of troops backed by air and naval support to help protect allies in Europe after Russia's invasion of Ukraine. Speaking after chairing a summit in Brussels, NATO Secretary General Jen Stoltenberg said the leaders had decided to send parts of the NATO response force and elements of a quickly deployed spearhead unit to the alliance's eastern flank. It's the first time the response force has been used in the defense of NATO allies. Stoltenberg didn't say how many troops would be deployed, but confirmed that the move would involve land, sea, and air power. He also briefly assessed the field of battle in Ukraine. The Ukrainian forces are fighting bravely, but again, it is uh, a very fluid and... Uh, and um, uh, an evolving situation. The United States, Britain, and the European Union all said today they will move to sanction Russian President Putin and Foreign Minister Lavrov. The EU's unanimous decision, part of a broader sanctions package, indicated that Western powers are moving toward unprecedented measures to try to force Putin to stop the invasion of Russia's neighbor and from unleashing a major war in Europe. White House Press Secretary Jen Psaki indicated the U.S. sanctions will include a travel ban. The move came as Russia vetoed a United Nations Security Council resolution that called on Moscow to withdraw troops and hold its attack on Ukraine. The United States and other supporters of the resolution knew it would not pass, but argued it would highlight Russia's international isolation. Christopher Martinez reports. 
The United States has announced new sanctions in response to the ongoing Russian invasion of Ukraine, on top of earlier sanctions targeting some Russian oligarchs and companies. White House Press Secretary Jen Psaki made the announcement at the White House Friday morning. Following a, televis- a telephone conversation uh, President Biden held with uh, European Commission President Ursula von der Leyen and in alignment with the decision by our European allies, the United States will join them in sanctioning President Putin and Foreign Minister Lavrov and members of the Russian National Security Team. The action marks a ratcheting up of sanctions coming after other U.S. sanctions that will affect an estimated 80 percent of Russia's banking sector. Meanwhile, the United Nations Security Council took up a resolution on Ukraine that, among other things, demanded a troop withdrawal. Ferit Hoxha is the Albanian ambassador to the UN. With its unprovoked aggression, Russia is not only inflicting untold pain and causing an unprecedented humanitarian situation in Europe, it has stained the UN Charter with innocent blood. It is burying the Charter under the rubble of destruction in Kiev and other cities in Ukraine. We must say no, and it is not too late to stop this madness. Dear colleagues, the resolution that Albania and the United States, together with many partners, have presented condemns Russia's actions, underscores that Russia must immediately cease its use of force against Ukraine and withdraw its forces. Eleven nations voted for the resolution, while three abstained, China, India and the United Arab Emirates. But as expected, Russia, a permanent member of the Security Council, vetoed the resolution. That drew the ire of U.S. Ambassador Linda Thomas-Greenfield. You can veto this resolution, but you cannot veto our voices. You cannot veto the truth. You cannot veto our principles. You cannot veto the Ukrainian people. You cannot veto the UN Charter, and you will not veto accountability. Barbara Woodward is the United Kingdom's ambassador. She says the resolution only failed because of a vote by the perpetrator of the invasion. Russia claims that its invasion of Ukraine is in self-defense. This is absurd. Russia's only act of self-defense is the vote they have cast against this resolution today. Make no mistake, Russia is isolated. It has no support for the invasion of Ukraine. Russian Ambassador Vasily Nebenzia, as it happened, chaired the meeting, speaking through a translator. And today's draft resolution, your draft resolution, is nothing other uh, than yet another brutal, inhumane move in this Ukrainian chessboard. He repeated Russian claims used to justify the invasion, and he also took aim at Western media for supposedly fake news. He also blasted the United States. Of course, it is difficult for us to uh, compete with the United States in terms of the number of invasions uh, t- uh, targeting their neighbors. I will refrain from uh, listing out the aggressions carried out by the United States in their history, but you are in no position to moralize. Ukraine's ambassador Sergei Kilitsya fired back. Your words have less value that, than a hole in the New York pretzel. Kenya's ambassador Martin Kimani also weighed in. Today, the precious fabric of our charter lies torn and trampled and threatened with further harm if there is no urgent and visionary leadership with a faith in diplomacy pushing in the opposite direction. If the United Nations Charter could speak for itself, it would vote for this resolution to affirm its central role in safeguarding our collective peace. The resolution will now likely go before the full UN General Assembly, where Russia does not have a veto. Meanwhile, debate continues in Congress and in Europe about what kind of sanctions or other actions should be taken next. Ukraine's Foreign Minister Dmitry Kuleba had a concise suggestion in a tweet Friday, saying, Stop Putin, isolate Russia, sever all ties, kick Russia out of everywhere. Reporting for Pacifica Radio News, KPFA, I'm Christopher Martinez. You're listening to the Evening News on KPFA in Berkeley, KPFK, Los Angeles, KFCF, Fresno, online, 
KPFA.org. Protest of Russia's invasion of Ukraine resumed in Moscow, St. Petersburg, and other cities in Russia today, even as authorities sought to push back against the spreading anti-war sentiment and projected image of strength and righteousness. Following large demonstrations the day before, the Kremlin sought to downplay the scale of the protests and insist on popular support for the attack. Journalists and television hosts were reported to face repercussions for publicly speaking out against the invasion. In the meantime, an online petition to stop the war started by a Russian human rights advocate continued to rapidly garner signatures, exceeding half a million some 24 hours after it was launched. Members of California's Ukrainian community and their supporters protested against the Russian invasion of their homeland in cities across the state. Hundreds rallied in San Francisco, Los Angeles, and at the state capitol. Suzanne Potter reports. The Ukrainian-American community rallied on the state capitol steps on Thursday, expressing outrage over Russia's ongoing invasion of Ukraine. Sacramento is home to about 100,000 Ukrainian-Americans who are watching events unfold in horror. Vladimir Scotts is chairman of Ukrainian-American House, a group based in Sacramento that brings the Ukrainian diaspora together. Scotts says he supports the strong financial sanctions imposed by President Joe Biden. We are calling for the whole world, the NATO, uh, to unite and protect Ukraine because we have to stop this evil over there in Ukraine. Because if Putin won't be stopped in Ukraine, he might go farther and bring other damages to the world. Ukrainian American House is planning a prayer breakfast at a Ukrainian church in the Sacramento region on Saturday. Advocates hope to raise awareness here in the U.S. about the fight to preserve democracy and independence in Ukraine. Scott says Russian President Vladimir Putin's decision to go to war is a threat to peace and stability around the world. One leader lost his mind and attacking other country just because Ukraine want to be free. Because Ukraine want to go from uh, propaganda towards education, towards NATO. Scott notes that in 1994, Ukraine gave up its nuclear weapons in exchange for a promise from Russia and the United States to protect its territorial integrity. During the so-called Orange Revolution of 2004 and 5, Russia was accused of trying to rig the election and of poisoning the opposition candidate who went on to win in a revote ordered by the Ukrainian Supreme Court. This is Suzanne Potter reporting. Ukrainians accounted for a substantial portion of the European settlers who landed in the state of North Dakota. And now their descendants are worried about what lies ahead for their country following Russia's invasion. Mike Moen has that story. The Ukrainian Culture Institute, based in Dickinson, says locals with ties to the country are watching the developments with great concern. UCI Director Kate Kessel says through the Homestead Act, Ukrainian immigrants came to North Dakota for farmland. Younger generations are now steeped in the American way of life, but she says they still worry loved ones back in Ukraine face the possibility of going back to Soviet-era rule. Ukraine just celebrated their 30th anniversary of freedom. So they are a young country, yet the people, they don't want to go back to their communist and be under communist rule. According to recent polling from the National Democratic Institute, roughly 75% of Ukrainians want to become a fully functioning democracy. World leaders opposed to Russian actions, including U.S. President Joe Biden, say the invasion is an attempt to reestablish the former Soviet Union. The UCI was established in 1980 to preserve Ukrainian culture in North Dakota. Kessel says as older immigrants and descendants retired, a number of them passed down their farms to their children. They're heartbroken to see loved ones across the globe not fully enjoy the freedoms they were afforded after coming to the U.S. Many of the older Ukrainians, they still have family, distant cousins back in Ukraine. And of course, you know, any unrest over there in their homeland is very concerning to them. Governor Doug Burgum issued a statement condemning Russia's actions, saying, quote, our thoughts are with those of Ukrainian heritage in North Dakota. The governor also expressed concern about North Dakota farmers and businesses with interests in Ukraine. Mike Moen, Prairie News Service. A leading Democratic senator says he thinks the Biden administration could ask Congress for $10 billion or more to finance the U.S. response to Russia's invasion of Ukraine. 
Delaware Democratic Senator Chris Coons said included would be money for the costs of Ukrainian refugees fleeing to Poland and nearby countries, helping those nations' militaries and moving more U.S. troops to Europe. The mayor of Munich, Germany, Dieter Reiter, has threatened to remove Valerie Gergayev as chief conductor of the Munich Philharmonic Orchestra, unless Gergayev publicly says by Monday that he does not support Russia's invasion of Ukraine. The Rotterdam Philharmonic Orchestra also said it would drop the 68-year-old Russian's planned festival there this September if he does not stop supporting Russian President Putin. In addition, the Royal Opera House today canceled a planned tour to London by Moscow's Bolshoi Ballet. Gurgayev is close to Putin and supported Russia's annexation of Crimea in 2014. The European Broadcasting Union says that Russia will not be allowed an entry in this year's Eurovision Song Contest because of the country's invasion of Ukraine. The union says in a statement that given the unprecedented crisis in Ukraine, the inclusion of a Russian entry would bring the competition into disrepute. The EBU says it's an a political organization aimed at uniting Europe through music. And the sporting world is turning its back on Russia. Russia has been stripped of hosting the Champions League final by the European Football Association, with St. Petersburg replaced by Paris. And Formula One dropped the season's Russian Grand Prix in Sochi in September. The showpiece final in European men's soccer will still be held on May 28th, but the 80,000-seat Stade de France will host the event. The International Ski Federation announced Russia will not host any more of its World Cup events this winter, and the European Curling Championship, scheduled to be held in November in Perm, Russia, will also be relocated. The International Tennis Federation canceled all events taking place in Russia, indefinitely. Ukrainian Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky said today he's willing to talk to Russia about the neutralization of Ukraine. Russian President Vladimir Putin has declared his goal of the invasion of Ukraine is the demilitarization and denazification of the country. John Pfeffer is the director of the publication Foreign Policy in Focus at the Institute for Policy Studies in Washington and author of the book Aftershock, A Journey into Eastern Europe's Broken Dreams. He spoke about Putin's strategy today to Brian Edwards Tiekert on the Upfront program. What Vladimir Putin wants to see uh, is not so much a denazification, because that, that, that doesn't really correspond to anything, but really, frankly, just demilitarization and neutralization of Ukraine, uh, a kind of Finlandization, if you will. Uh, in other words, the role that Finland played during the Cold War, bordering the Soviet Union, but practically having no uh, military or foreign policy of its own without, say, tacit approval coming from Moscow. I think that's what uh, Vladimir Putin is looking for. That kind of demilitarization, would that imply that, like, Russia gets up to its elbows in, in reforming Ukraine's military and security apparatus? Like, what, what would the verification regime be? I think it would be not so much a verification regime as a, uh, as a blackmail regime. In other words, if whatever political uh, formation emerges from this crisis in Ukraine does not accede to Russian demands, uh, then there will continue to be the threat that Russia will um, reoccupy or reinvade the country. Um, And probably, of course, Russia will continue to maintain its military presence, obviously in Crimea, which it already is absorbed, but also in the eastern regions of Donetsk and Luhansk, uh, 
much as Russia has remain, uh, remained in, for instance, South Ossetia, uh, the, the Abkhazia, the sections in Georgia that broke away from the Georgian uh, politics. Um, so I, I don't see uh, necessarily Putin wanting to get into the weeds in Ukraine. Um, uh, I think he would prefer to have a relationship similar to the one he has with Belarus, in which someone like Lukashenko, um, the head of uh, Belarus, someone like that emerges in Ukraine who will do the dirty work for him. We may be ahead of our skis because uh, obviously no talks have started yet. Russian forces are encircling Kiev and preparing what what appears to be a, a decapitation strike, uh, take over the capital, take out the government, um, and impose the situation they want by force of arms. Um, John Pfeffer, I'm curious about how your thinking about what Vladimir Putin wants has changed over the course of the past week since the invasion started. Not so much what uh, Vladimir Putin wants. Uh, of course, my thinking about how he is going about getting what he wants has changed. Um, in terms of what he wants, well, it has been relatively consistent uh, from basically since he took over in 1999. Uh, some time ago, obviously, and that is to secure a um, uh, Russian influence and Russian security uh, concerns in what Russia calls its near abroad. In other words, the areas that border Russia that have large Russian-speaking populations. Um, And that has been uh, the kind of animating motivation behind his policy toward Georgia, his policy toward Moldova. Um, It has been thwarted, of course, in the Baltic republics by their uh, membership in NATO. And I think that, of course, changed his calculus. Uh, He realized that NATO itself was uh, a major threat to Russian interests and that, above all, it was necessary to prevent any other bordering countries from entering uh, the security alliance. Now, uh, how he goes about kind of realizing those ambitions, well, that has changed. Uh, there will, the, in, the military incursions in Georgia and Moldova were limited, um, and he has basically, you know, stayed at arm's length from, for instance, uh, the security problems, shall we say, the the challenges to authority in Kazakhstan and Belarus. Of course, you know, he provided support for those governments, but certainly did not send in Russian troops. Ukraine represents a, a different challenge. It's a very large country. Uh, if it were to, for instance, join the European Union or join NATO, uh, you would have a very significant country, not only in size, but in terms of its economy, in terms of what it exports, food, energy, uh, city right there on Russian borders. And uh, that was something that Putin uh, simply could not abide by. Uh, He thought perhaps that the amassing of troops on the border would be sufficient to get a compromise from the West, uh, basically acceding to the neutrality of Ukraine. That did not come. And so now he has invaded in order to get that neutrality. Now, whether that neutrality will come from a negotiation table uh, in Belarus or elsewhere, or whether it will come by fiat uh, at the point of a rifle, that still remains to be seen. John Pfeffer of Foreign Policy in Focus and author of Aftershock, A Journey into Eastern Europe's Broken Dreams. And you are listening to the Evening News on KPFA in Berkeley, KPFK in Los Angeles, KFCF in Fresno, online at kpfa.org. This is an hour-long newscast airing each night at 6 o'clock without interruption. It's also archived online at kpfa.org. And it's available by subscription podcast there. I'm Mark Miracle. And folks... um, just a personal note. This is the this is difficult duty. This is hard duty here, bringing you <clears throat> this amount of information and trying to uh, put it into some kind of uh, order and some kind of uh, comprehensible uh, form. Uh, 
it, it's just overwhelming the amount of information about what's going on in the world today that um, I'm trying to deal with here. <clears throat> and then I have to stop and kind of think about how we're going to pay for it all because um, you're listening to a listener-sponsored radio station. Um, in case you haven't heard, uh, almost all our money comes from you, the listener, and it's, it's not by door-to-door -door canvas. It's by the listener, which means we do it as you listen, and we appeal for it as we broadcast. And that's what I'm trying to do right now because we are in the middle of the Winter Fund Drive, which is absolutely the largest and most crucial fundraising event of the year, and it is absolutely necessary that we bring it off successfully. And uh, boom, we're in the middle of probably one of the worst uh, political crises that the world's had since World War II. Hopefully, uh, we can back it off a little bit or a lot. At any rate, um, I have to stop the news and raise some money. And so I hope you will have mercy, <laughs> if not on my soul, at least on the task that it, uh, that this radio station needs to accomplish and make a contribution to keep this journalistic effort functioning. If you are listening in Southern California, the number to call and make a contribution, a donation, a listener-sustaining Amount, a monthly contribution, a monthly pledge. That telephone number is 818 985 5735. That number in Southern California, 818 985 5735. Or go online. Uh, there's uh, gifts, uh, thank you gifts for your contribution that can be had. If you go online, you can find them. I can't tell you about it because that would even cut more into this newscast and prevent me from uh, doing a major job, which is deliver to deliver the news to you. 818-985-5735 or online at kpfk.org. KPFK.org. And it's ditto for those of you who are listening in Northern and Central California, except... There's a different phone number. That phone number is 1-800-439-5732, 1-800-439-5732, or online at kpfa.org, kpfa.org online. And compounding it all is the fact that this is a Friday evening, uh, which is the most difficult time slot to raise money uh, of the most difficult of the week since uh, people are worn out by the week's events and uh, maybe you're just capable of doing nothing more than vegging out or they're going out on the town or they're eating dinner or whatever. They're otherwise preoccupied. So if you are one of the few people, <laughs> the handful the stalwarts who are listening to the newscast tonight and are capable of making a, a contribution, I'm asking especially that you make it now because this is the most difficult time to have an audience and to get donations. So, once again, in Southern California, 818-985-5735. In Northern and Central California, 1-800-439-5732. Our goal tonight is to get 20 of you to make a contribution, to make a call, to go online and make a contribution, a donation. KPFA.org is the online address in Northern and Central California. KPFK is .org is the online address in Southern California. No one on the line right now. We're looking for 20 callers or contributors online by the end of this newscast, asking for your help tonight. President Joe Biden today 
nominated federal appeals court judge Kenji Brown Jackson to the Supreme Court, making her the first black woman selected to serve on a court that once declared her race unworthy of citizenship and endorsed segregation. In Jackson, Biden delivered on a campaign promise to make the historic appointment and to further diversify a court that was made up entirely of white men for almost two centuries. Marina Newman has the story. President Joe Biden nominated federal appeals court judge Katanji Brown Jackson to the Supreme Court on Friday, making her the first black woman nominated to the Supreme Court. Brown Jackson, 51, a graduate of Harvard Law School who clerked under Justice Stephen Breyer, will replace Justice Breyer, who is retiring at the end of the term this summer. Her nomination will not change the court's 6-3 conservative majority. President Biden introduced Brown Jackson alongside Vice President Kamala Harris. Biden called Brown Jackson a, quote, proven consensus builder and pragmatic, traits he says he looked for when searching for a replacement for Justice Breyer. During this process, you look for someone who, like Justice Breyer, has a pragmatic understanding that the law must work for the American people. Someone who has historical perspective to understand that the Constitution is a resilient charter of liberty. Someone with the wisdom to appreciate that the Constitution protects certain inalienable rights. Rights that fall within the most fundamental personal freedoms that our society recognizes. In the end, someone with extraordinary character will bring to the Supreme Court an independent mind, uncompromising integrity, and with a strong moral compass and the courage to stand up for what she thinks is right. In the nomination of Brown Jackson, Biden delivers on a campaign promise he made during a South Carolina debate to nominate the first black woman to the Supreme Court. Brown Jackson will be the current court's second black justice alongside Justice Clarence Thomas and the third in history. Her nomination is subject to confirmation by the Senate, where Democrats hold the majority by a razor-thin margin, Vice President Harris being the tiebreaker. Party leaders have promised to vote on the president's nominee quickly. However, Democratic Senator Ray Lujan of New Mexico's absence due to a stroke last month and Russia's invasion of Ukraine could extend this timeline. Democrats will need Lujan's vote if no Republicans support her. It is unclear whether any Republicans will support Biden's nominee. South Carolina Senator Lindsey Graham has expressed disappointment in a statement on Friday that his preferred choice, Judge J. Michelle Childs, was not nominated by Biden. He and several other Republican lawmakers have criticized Biden's nominee, Graham saying that Biden has gone with the choice of the, quote, radical left. On Friday, Biden and Brown Jackson attempted to rebut GOP criticism that she will likely face during her nomination hearing of being a radical jurist. Biden repeatedly emphasized that Brown Jackson has in the past received both Democratic and Republican support, noting that she was enthusiastically supported by Judge Thomas Griffith, a George Bush appointee to the appeals court. Biden and Brown Jackson also emphasized Brown Jackson's family connection to law enforcement and the praise Jackson received from the Fraternal Order of Police, the country's largest policing organization. Republican Senators Lindsey Graham, Susan Collins, and Liza Murkowski have supported Jackson's confirmation in the past to the Court of Appeals. Republican Senator Susan Collins of Maine, who has voted for Supreme Court nominees from both parties, will be watched closely in the coming weeks. Collins has suggested on Friday that she is open to supporting Jackson again. Republican Senator Liza Murkowski of Alaska's vote is also unclear. For KPFA News, I'm Rena Newman. Brown Jackson would also be the high court's first former public defender, although she also possesses the elite legal background of other justices. And she will join the court as it weighs cutbacks to abortion rights and will be considering ending affirmative action in college admissions and restricting voting rights, especially for minority voters. Under new guidelines released today... Most Americans live in places where healthy people 
including students in schools, can safely take a break from wearing masks. The Centers for Disease Control and Prevention outlined the new set of measures for communities where COVID-19 is easing its grip. With less of a focus on positive test results and more on what's happening at hospitals. The new system greatly changes the look of the CDC's risk map and puts more than 70% of the U.S. population in counties where the coronavirus is posing a low or medium threat to hospitals. The agency said those are the people who can stop wearing masks. The agency is still advising people, including school children, to wear masks where the risk of COVID-19 is high. That's the situation in about 37% of U.S. counties, where about 28% of Americans live. The new recommendations do not change the requirement to wear masks on public transportation and indoors in airports, train stations, and bus stations. The CDC guidelines for other indoor spaces aren't binding, meaning cities and institutions, even in areas of low risk, may set their own rules. And the agency says people with COVID-19 symptoms or who test positive should not stop wearing masks. But with protection from immunity rising, both from vaccination and from infection, the CDC said the overall risk of severe disease is now generally lower. Anybody is certainly welcome to wear a mask at any time if they feel safer wearing a mask, CDC Director Dr. Rochelle Walensky said in a news briefing. We want to make sure our hospitals are okay and people are not coming in with severe disease. Anyone can go to the CDC website, find out the volume of disease in their community and make that decision. Some states, including Massachusetts, Connecticut, and New Jersey, are at low to medium risk, while others Others, such as West Virginia, Kentucky, Florida, and Arizona, still have wide areas at high levels of concern. CDC's previous transmission prevention guidance to communities focused on two measures, the rate of new COVID-19 cases and the percentage of positive test results over the previous week. Based on those measures, agency officials advised people to wear masks indoors in counties where spread of the virus was deemed substantial or high. As of this week, more than 3,000 of the nation's more than 3,200 counties, greater than 95%, were listed as having substantial or high transmission under those guidelines. That guidance has been increasingly ignored, however, with state, cities, counties, and school districts across the U.S. announcing plans to drop mask mandates amid declining COVID-19 cases and hospitalizations and deaths. Santa Clara County in Northern California could join the rest of the Bay Area and the state in dropping its indoor mask mandate next Wednesday. Public Health Director Dr. Sarah Cody said she had set three metrics to take that step and the county's on the verge of meeting the last guideline, which is low community transmission. We've hit the metric for the first time we need to stay there uh, for seven days. Uh, so we are on track and given the steady decline in cases uh, that we continue to see, um, I'm fairly confident that we will be able to lift the go. masking requirement on March 2nd. Cody said Santa Clara County has already met the other two metrics. Hospitalizations are low and stable. The vaccination rate is high. She said just under 85% of the county population is vaccinated. San Jose Mayor Sam Licardo has announced a proposal to change the booster mandate for public entry on all city-owned facilities, including the SAP Center Convention Center and Historic Theaters, in response to the recent decline of Omicron variant COVID-19 cases. Licardo says... San Jose continues to have the highest vaccination rate of any major U.S. city, with more than 90% of residents over five years old having received at least two doses. 
Moderna COVID-19 vaccine brought in nearly $7 billion in the final quarter of last year. The pharmaceutical company says it signed purchase agreements for another $19 billion in sales this year. The vaccine maker's COVID-19 shots, which are now available in more than 70 countries, totaled $17.7 billion in sales last year. That was their first full year on the market. You're listening to the KPFA Evening News on KPFA in Berkeley, KPFK in Los Angeles, KFCF in Fresno, online at kpfa.org. This is Brian Edwards Teekert, broadcasting from my home in Berkeley. Every morning with Kat Brooks, we are doing COVID coverage from a safe distance on Upfront. From 7 to 9 a.m., we talk to doctors, public health specialists, elected officials, political analysts. We take your calls and we air your stories. And we also try to lift up people doing heroic and inspiring things to help each other. We are live, local, and socially distanced weekdays at 7 a.m., right after Democracy Now! on Upfront. And uh, we are, we've had 12 donors, 12 callers, 12 contributors, either using the telephone or online. Our goal tonight is 20. So we've got eight to go. And we've got 13 minutes left in this newscast. Thanks to Brent in Kensington, uh, anonymous donors in Walnut Creek, Berkeley, and Point Richmond, John in San Rafael, Forest in San Jose, Jeremy in Bodega Bay, among those who called 1-800-439-5732 in Northern or Central California or went online at kpfa.org. I can't, uh, I don't get a readout of donors in Southern California, but there might be one or two or three or four. Let's hope five or six at 818-985-5735 in Southern California. Listening to KPFK in Los Angeles, 818-985-5735. Or who went online at kpfk.org. Still looking for help. Need eight more of you in order to reach our goal tonight. 1-800-439-5732 or kpfa.org in Northern and Central California, 818-985-5735, KPFK in Southern California. California's Ocean Protection Council met this week and approved a first-in-the-nation plan to reduce microplastic pollution in the seas. The plan is part of California's larger strategic plan to address climate change. Mark Gold, executive director of the council, or OPC, on the increasing health risks that microplastics are causing. Well, we know microplastics pollution problems are growing exponentially, and the latest science continues to shed light on the scope and scale of the toxic impacts to marine life and human health. Most plastics in the ocean break off into smaller particles that become nearly impossible to remove from marine life. These pieces come from personal care products, tires, single-use food containers, cigarette filters, and synthetic clothing fibers. Research done in the San Francisco Bay shows stormwater is a primary pathway for microplastics to, end the, to enter the estuary. Caitlin Kalua, Water Quality Program Manager, summarizes the OPC's approach. The statewide microplastic strategy provides a multi-year roadmap with 22 recommended early actions and 13 research priorities that will allow California to take a national and global leadership role in managing microplastic pollution. Recommended early actions fall under the following three categories. Pollution prevention to eliminate plastic waste at its source. Pathway intervention, such as stormwater and wastewater, to intervene with the mobilization of microplastics. And outreach and education. In addition to the San Francisco Bay, microplastics have been observed throughout state waters, including Monterey Bay, the Greater Fairlands National Marine Sanctuary, Lake Tahoe, and in Southern California waterways. Plastic pellet pollution from manufacturing facilities has spilled and reached California's beaches. 
The plan acknowledges limitations to regulating the pollutant and that more research is needed. Margaret Gordon from the West Oakland Environmental Indicators Project pointed out that the environmental justice issues and the impact on vulnerable communities were either missing or minimally addressed in the OPC report. I am really concerned about the data did not address environmental justice as who is being most vulnerable and impacted. And also, how do we how do we do the activism to change the overall use of collective plastics, and all products. Because everything that we consume at some level has plastics. State Controller Betty Yee, who co-chairs the OPC, urged council members to strengthen the statement on vulnerable communities while maintaining the momentum necessary to actually begin addressing the problem. It is uh, really recognizing that uh, our um, vulnerable communities are are uh, really one of the reasons why we need to move with um, uh, greater urgency. Overall, the plan was met with enthusiasm and support, and the state could move forward on enacting the multi-year roadmap. Climate justice campaigners are urging President Biden to tackle the climate crisis with the urgency it demands. More than a thousand groups have signed on to a letter to the president ahead of Tuesday's State of the Union address. The letter says climate activists watched Biden campaign as a climate champion, but they say his actions since have fallen short. They want Biden to declare a climate emergency. They're also demanding that Biden stop approving fossil fuel projects and follow through on his promise to ban all new oil and gas leasing, drilling, and fracking on federal lands and in federal waters. New research from the Environmental Defense Canada makes the case that there's a path forward to shutting down the Line 5 dual pipelines for gas and oil, which run under the Straits of Mackinac in Michigan. Molly Bolke reports. The Canadian gas company Enbridge Energy plans to build a tunnel to contain the pipeline, but some engineers think the proposal poses safety risks. Canadian officials have supported the pipeline, citing the company's claims that closing it would put the country's natural gas supply at risk. But Beth Wallace with the National Wildlife Federation says this report shows alternatives that would not cause major disruptions. Line 5 is almost 20 years past its useful engineered life, according to the experts that originally constructed the pipeline. The location itself, 20% of the world's fresh water, drinking water for millions of people, it should have never been put there to begin with. The report outlines possible alternatives, such as rerouting some of the Line 5 supply to another pipeline, Line 78, and other fossil fuel transport options. Enbridge says Line 78 is full serving existing customers and cannot accommodate more, and that increasing fuel transport capacity would take years to develop and also harm the environment. Wallace adds another motivation for closing Line 5, not covered in the report, is how fast the transition away from fossil fuels is moving, particularly in the automotive sector. She says the risks to the environment and tribal water rights are too high to continue operating the pipelines. Now that it's 70 years old, we have alternatives, we're transitioning away from fossil fuels. There's just absolutely no reason why we can't start to transition, including with this particular pipeline. After Michigan Governor Gretchen Whitmer ordered Line 5 to be shut down last year, the Canadian government invoked a 1977 treaty between the U.S. and Canada to block that action. So far, the Biden administration hasn't supported the shutdown, although tribal leaders and environmental groups note it violates the water rights of Bay Mills Indian community whose ancestral home is the Straits of Mackinac. This is Lily Bolke with Michigan News Connection. Thanks to Kirsta in Occidental, anonymous listeners in SoCal, Bodega and Oakland, Jason in Redwood City, Kimberly in Santa Rosa, Julie in El Sobrante, and Michael in Oakland. We are up to 15 donors. I can almost smell the finish line. I can't see it. I'm sensing it. 
We're five minutes away from the end of the newscast. Five minutes away from reaching our goal. We need five more contributors. One eight hundred four three nine five seven three two in Northern and Central California, or nine one eight. Excuse me, 818-818-985-5735 in Southern California, listening to KPFK in Los Angeles. Four more tribes are asking a judge to block restrictive new election laws ahead of the November midterms. It's part of a larger battle over vote access in Native communities. Bert Johnson of Mountain West News Bureau reports. Montana passed laws to eliminate voter registration on election day and limit ballot collection. But tribal governments say that'll disproportionately impact Native voters, who often live far from the polls. Jacqueline de Leon is with the Native American Rights Fund, which represents the tribes. She says a judge blocked a similar Montana law because it violated the state constitution. And in Nevada, tribes successfully sued to expand voter access on their reservations. We'll continue to file lawsuits where Native Americans are being discriminated against. And we'll either force compliance or we'll hopefully spur a change. De Leon is a member of the Isleta Pueblo in New Mexico. She says some legislatures in Western states are trying to make it harder to vote. A Utah bill aims to end mail balloting. In Arizona, some lawmakers want to get rid of drop boxes. For National Native News, I'm Burt Johnson. Two anonymous listeners in Oakland. They're not really anonymous. They just don't want to be thanked by name on the air. So they're unnamed. Two unnamed listeners in Oakland and one in San Francisco. We are up to 18. 18 out of 20. That's not bad, but I would like to get to that 20. Would you be caller number 19? And you would be donor number 20 if you follow on his or her heels. one 800 Four three nine five seven three two in Northern California or KPFA dot org or eight one eight nine eight five five seven three five in Southern California or KPFK dot org. Federal regulators have issued a draft environmental statement saying there are significant benefits to a plan to demolish four massive dams on Northern California's Klamath River to save imperiled migratory salmon. That sets the stage for the largest dam demolition project in U.S. history. The issuing of the statement today by the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission clears a major regulatory hurdle for the project and paves the way for public hearings on the document before a final draft is issued as soon as this summer. That would allow preparations to begin in earnest for taking down the dams. The aging dams were built before current environmental regulations. And the NCAA has relaxed the amount of THC an athlete can have to trigger a positive test and is recommending less stringent penalties for athletes who do test positive for marijuana. The threshold levels for THC, which is the active ingredient in marijuana, will go from 35 nanograms per milliliter to 150 nanograms per milliliter, which the NCAA says is in line with the World Anti-Doping Agency's levels. The threshold level change is effective immediately and is retroactive to drug tests taken in the fall. Marijuana legal in some form, medical, recreational, or both in the majority of U.S. states. One caller to go. One more. We Thanks to the anonymous donor in San Anselmo. We just need one more of you while I give the weather. Mostly cloudy tomorrow in the San Francisco Bay Area with a high near 60 degrees in the central San Joaquin Valley. Tonight, there's a low of 30. Tomorrow, mostly sunny. Highs in the mid-60s and in Los Angeles, mostly sunny with the highs tomorrow in the low 70s. Avacha. They came running from the clan holding on to everything they had. 
Well, others are just looking for something to hold on to. The blues came west looking for freedom land. L.A., Sacramento, and San Francisco had that big city thing. Folks rocked in Russell City. Vallejo had a scene. Richmond had a kind of smooth Chi-Town sound of thing. But if you wanted a gut-wrenching, soul-taking, down-home blues, you know, the kind of uh, blues that that, 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 that that your mama warned you about and the church warned you about, the, the kind of blues that made your hair stand on end, snatched you out of chairs, made you shout after a fool, jump up and dance, that good old makes you want to have that kind of blues, you have to come to Oakland, 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 the blues make of the West Coast. Steve was as wild and sophisticated as you were. Storytelling for social change on KPFX.